Um, so this is a continuation of the series. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I want to do this, this every week, but um, and I'm going to have to do this, I'm sorry, because I know this. Um, but the Ten Commandments, I really want to just uh, introduce uh, again um, the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the source, the structure, the purpose. Talk a little bit about the First Commandment. Um, So we know that, um, well, we should know, it's Exodus chapter 20. Um, and that's after Moses has led the, the uh, children of Israel out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, into the wilderness. Um, they complained off and on, and finally get to a place where I caused Moses to the mountain uh, to receive his commandments. And that gets us to Exodus 20, and we'll see if we can do this. This is the preface to the Ten Commandments. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. And so first, the source of the commandments. Uh, God spoke these words, I am the Lord, Yahweh, sovereign, um, the nearness, the means, your God, a personal God, Elohim, creator, um, and then redeemer, who brought you out of uh, Egypt, the land of slavery. So God is a personal God, um, and he is to be, be worshipped. Um, and really, in, in the context, I think this preface, preface teaches us that because God is the Lord um, and Redeemer, we're really bound to keep his commandments. And so, briefly, the structure of the Ten Commandments there are four that focus on God um, and duty to God, and six that um, relate to um, our, our duty to, to one another. Um, Jesus reinforces this in. Mark chapter 12, when he's asked, um, one of the teachers came of, of the law, came and, and heard them debating, and noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is hear this, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So we'll focus on, on the Lord. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. So Jesus wraps up and, and uh, uh, ties that together for us. And so the purpose of the law, I did a whole message on this, but the law serves to, to indicate or exhibit the moral perfection of God, uh, provides a standard by which society is imperfectly governed and serves as a guide to how to please God and do his will. And the law reveals the inexcusable guilt of man and convicts him as a sinner. We see this when Paul writes to the Romans. Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And the law isn't a ladder that we climb. We can't earn our way or climb our way to heaven by following the law. But it's more like a mirror that shows we're dirty. We can't wash in the mirror, but we need to be clean. So the law sends us to Jesus as we recognize our sin and realize our need for a Savior. In the process of sanctification, becoming more Christ-like, Christ sends us back to the law with a deeper understanding of the higher righteousness that can come from the liberal reading. And we know that from at least from a couple of examples in Matthew 5, um, Jesus says, You shall not murder anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But Jesus says, I tell you, anyone who is angry with the brother is subject to judgment. He also has the same kind of concept with respect to adultery. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. And so it's this back and forth. We hear the law, we seek Jesus, we go back to Jesus, and we understand the law in a, in a more deeper and deeper way. The Ten Commandments were given by our Lord God, Redeemer, they reveal God's holy standard, and through the law comes the knowledge of sin, which is the first step towards faith in Christ. Our first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I don't know how many people have a shorter catechism. It's uh, pretty neat. There's 107 questions here, um, and it was written in 1647. Um, and the first questions deal with um, what we believe, and the, and the latter part of the book is, is really how we are to act, so it's faith and practice. And uh, one of the questions is um, really, what, what is what 
as God intended in the first commandment? And the answer is the first commandment teaches us the only proper object of worship. It is God, and there's none beside him. English um, evangelist A.W. Pinker, Arthur Wilkinson Pink, writes, it requires that we have a love for him stronger than all our other affections, that we take him for our highest portion, that we serve him and obey him supremely. It requires that all those acts of worship which we render unto the true God be made with the utmost sincerity and devotion. Timothy Keller writes that the first commandment implies an exclusive relationship. God is saying he will be our God or something else will. He does not leave the possibility of having no gods at all that we will, not, that we will rely on to save us. And Martin Luther indicates that the first commandment prohibits idolatry of the gods because we never break the other commandments without breaking the first. It could be argued that every everything we do wrong, every cruel action, dishonest word, broken promise, self-centered attitude stems from a conviction deep in our souls that there is something more crucial to our happiness than the love of God. To have other gods, something more crucial to our happiness than the love of God is a breach of that relationship. So the first commandment concerns the choice of the true God as the proper object of worship. And that brings us to our second commandment. Exodus 20, 4 to 6. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I think there are two poles for idolatry. One is to make an image of a false god, and the other is to make an image depicting the true god. I think some false gods that, that we have that, that people bow to today, even if they've not made a physical image, um, and the list is long, but we'll just highlight a few. Entertainments or sports or some consuming hobby which can push worship off the schedule. Some place their hope are confident in science and technology, and I had my first real exposure uh, to this when I was about 12 or 13 years old. A friend was, and I were, were talking, and I forget whether it was the nuclear, which was really big in the 60s, or uh, air pollution or whatever, but his view was, don't worry, science will take care of it. And I remember even as a, as a junior high person thinking, really? Uh, we got here because of science. Um, and and uh, but, but some truly place, and he did as a, as a 12 year old, may still for all I know. Um, some of us drive our God to work. Um, we've invested in our car, and a scratch on it just about kills us. Um, not in our house. Some live in their gods. We've stretched really to afford their, their homes and possessions. Some look in the mirror and see their gods, self-worship. How much do we use the term I in our conversations or our thoughts? What do we expect or demand of others in situations for ourselves? Do we deserve this or that? Some look to money and possessions for security. Anything that we can grab onto to fill that God-made void in our souls is idolatry. Scripture speaks of covetousness or, or greed as idolatry. Reading from Ephesians. For this you know with certainty that no immoral, impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, and that's from Colossians. This is the challenge that I have in this regard. Work. Um, to take my eye off of Jesus, but the status or pursuit of leadership can as well. Uh, if it becomes our main source of fulfillment, we can, get, we can forget who we're ultimately serving. People can serve or worship the creature more than the creator. And we read in Romans 1 and 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. Amen. Does creation cause us to marvel at a God at who God is, or do we begin to worship what we see? The list goes on, and if we're honest, uh, we have areas on this list, at least from time to time. Rusty has challenged us of, of late to live spirit-filled lives, not just in dwelt, but spirit-filled lives. And the root of whatever keeps us from living that spirit-filled life uh, is, is really on the list. There's so 
some confusion, and, and I struggled with this, that if we get the first commandment right, we're all set with the second. If we have no other God than the God revealed in Scripture, we'll have no trouble with idolatry. Frankly, I think the areas I just mentioned uh, are examples of idolatry that are forbidden in the first commandment. So why is the second commandment necessary? The first commandment deals with, with who you worship, and the second deals with how we will worship. Recall the Shorter Catechism indicates that the first commandment teaches that God is the proper object of worship. There is none beside or before him. There is one true living God, the sovereign Lord of the universe. The first commandment establishes that fact. As Lord God, the creator of all people, he has a major concern, and that's how people worship him. The second commandment is about God being worshipped the way he wants to be worshipped, not necessarily in the way we want to worship him. Thomas Watson, a Puritan writer in the 1600s and author of a book entitled The Ten Commandments, writes, In the first commandment, worshipping a false god is forbidden. forbidden. In this, the second commandment, worshipping the true God in a false name is forbidden. The second commandment forbids the worship of God through material objects or images. Remember I said there are two poles to idolatry. One is to make an image of a false god, and the other is to make an image of the true God. The latter, making an image of the true God, is what I think the second commandment focuses on. The passage says you shall not make an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath. The word image is related to imagination. In Isaiah 40, 18, we read, With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? How can we possibly imagine God adequately? Frankly, we can't. And in so trying, we bring God to our love and have thoughts about God and images of God that are not worthy of God. When we say, I like to think of God as, and we can fill in with my loving father, righteous judge, my co-pilot, um, which I just think is um, what people do it and, and have that view. God is in the box on the seat beside me to pick up when I fall asleep or, or do those things. When we think about God in such terms, we limit God, we make him smaller than he is, and we commit idolatry as defined, I think, in this commandment. There's idolatry in the church. Um, if the form of worship or the liturgy uh, becomes our view of what God needs, um, then the form becomes more important than the worship itself. Do we get uncomfortable when the order of worship changes? I, I don't think so, but um, that's not what it's about. A church building can take on too much importance. It's a place where people come together to worship, um, or is it a place that concerns people more than the worship itself? What about pictures, crucifixes, statues, or other things which stir our memory to pray to worship? The commandment doesn't focus or forbid artistic creation, but it is clearly directed against making and using images and idols for the purpose of worship. You know, we can consider the, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. They were full of religious objects and art by God's command. The problem comes when the symbol becomes a substitute for God. Again, Thomas Watson writes, God is to be adored in the heart, not painted to the eye. To set up an image to represent God is debasing him. If anyone should make an image of snakes and spiders, saying he did it to represent his prince or leader, would not the prince take it in disdain? So what are the problems with images depicting God? First, they're inadequate. They do not and cannot complete the picture. They're localized. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Um, it's impossible to encapsulate God in a box or in a painting or a statue. Images give the delusion of control. If we've made them, we can control them. And symbols can lose their meaning or mean different things to different people. The cross of Christ was a place of judgment, punishment, and terror. Jesus was crucified on the next cross made, not a special cross. And today we find crosses in front of all manner of churches, with all manner of beliefs, and so the symbol means different things to different people. A symbol can evolve to be an object of worship. An item may be made to serve as a reminder of God or an attribute of God, but due to superstition of the passage of time, the symbol can be transformed to reality in people's minds. And we see this in the Old Testament. 
If we remember it in Numbers, uh, I'm reading 21, 6. The Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And so Moses made a bronze snake, snake put it on a pole, then when anyone was bitten by the snake, they looked at it and they lived. But what happens? About 750 years later, or during the time of 2 Kings, we read, In the third year of Hosea, son of Eliah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. They were worshiping the symbol. Images distort God and his direct being. No matter how good the link image is, it limits or conceals most of the true character of God. What did Jesus look like? We have a lot of paintings, and in fact, I was going to show a, a bunch of them. I went on a website that said pictures of Jesus, and there was one that had 600 that came up, and then there was another one with 400 to, to pick from. Most pictures show Jesus as looks fairly tall, slender, long flowing hair, usually in a long robe, um, at least those pictures when he's not on the cross. Um, but we have no idea what Jesus looks like, you know? and I would contend that most of those pictures are not an accurate representation. He was a carpenter. He probably had very rough hands. He was probably a, a rather uh, strong man. He was able to speak to uh, the fishermen and said, come follow me. And they followed him, and a friend, when I was in high school, said, yeah, these pictures of Jesus, he looks like a wimp. What fisherman, a big rugged guy, would follow a wimp? And we don't know, but, but some of the pictures, I think, um, tell maybe part of the story, certainly, um, but may not be accurate at all. I was reading that a carpenter just wouldn't have long hair in the day because it would be in the way. And Jesus, we, we know, wasn't remarkable in, in his appearance because he was able to slip away in, into the crowds, um, which would suggest he wasn't taller or unique in his appearance in any way, shape, or form. In fact, God is intentionally silent in his word, except to say in Isaiah 53 that there was nothing special about his appearance to attract us. In Isaiah 53, too, he writes, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. If we knew what Jesus looked like, just think of the challenges might be posed by those who look similarly. Right? How about the crucifix? Jesus on the cross is accurate to some degree, but it falls short of the fullness of Christ. He's not there today. A crucifix displays the truth, but does not represent the full truth. Christ's Godhead is united to his manhood. That makes him Christ. In light of the second commandment, to focus on a picture of his manhood when we can't picture his Godhead is a sin. We separate out the chief thing that makes him Christ. The passage goes on in verse 5 to point out that idolatry is spiritual adultery. You shall not bow to them, bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. God's displeasure is rightly called jealousy. In Exodus 34, 14, we read, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. In Psalm 78, 58, they angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their gods. And there are other passages, too, that suggest that um, God has that attribute. It's so much of the, the, the statement, um, a jealous God, is not a statement of intolerance, but of the exclusiveness in the relationship that God desires with us. It's like that of a marriage. A good husband or wife will not behave in a way that gives their spouse reason for jealousy. God does not want anything coming between him and his people. God loves and cares for man, and because of this, he does not want his people to be in error following false gods. The passage gives us 
stir in the morning. Those who worship with images and idols are said to hate God. Why? Because those who love God obey His commandments. You see that in John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. The verse speaks of punishing children for the sins of the parents. I want to just make this clear. God does not punish those um, for the sins of others. There's a couple passages. Deuteronomy 24, 16. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sins. And in Ezekiel 18, the person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous, righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But there are consequences. The influence... Um, pushes down from parents to children. We should not focus on the literal number of the generations here, but the concept, which is that sin has consequences beyond the sinner. There's a positive outcome of following the commandment, and that's experiencing God's mercy. And God promises that those who honor Him, that His steadfast grace or love will extend for a thousand generations. And of course, a thousand generations hasn't happened. It's 20,000 years in round numbers. So it's figurative speech. Our culture is largely ignorant of the true God. It's reduced to a form and stature that makes us comfortable and less accountable. Images of God fail because they're deficient in showing His glory and fully expressing His nature. God is not localized and cannot be controlled. It is a violation of the commandment to worship an image of God created by man's imagination. It's wrong to picture what we think God is like and worship that image of God. God has revealed himself in Scripture. It is God revealed in Scripture that we are to know and worship. Pink writes, The second commandment is but the negative way of saying that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. To make a true image of God is impossible. God is spirit and thus invisible. And he's referencing the passage of the woman at the well. Yet a time is coming, and it's now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. I just want to read a, a passage. Um, Adrian Rob, Rogers actually wrote this. He was um, a Southern Baptist pastor, and he was head of the Southern Baptist Convention, passed away in 2005. Idolatry is wrong because it gives a distorted or false picture of God. An idol is a material thing, and no idol can represent the invisible spiritual God. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit. That is, spirit is his very essence. No wonder then that Jesus went on to say, they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What material thing could possibly represent spirit? God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. God is spirit. There is nowhere where God is not, and no material thing can represent him. There's nothing you can compare God to or with. There's nothing that says, this is what God is totally like. God himself asked, to whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal? Isaiah 40, 25. We can say one man is like another man, one chair is like another chair, one piano like another piano, and so on. But there is only one God. You can't compare him to anyone or anything. Mm -hmm. Suppose a woman walks into the room and finds her husband embracing another woman. He sees his wife out of the corner of his eyes, and he says, Now, wait a minute, honey, don't get the wrong idea. Let me tell you what I was doing. This woman is so beautiful, she reminded me of you. I was really thinking of you when I was embracing her. There's not a woman in America who would buy it, and God doesn't buy it either when we worship something and say, now, Lord, wait a minute. Don't get the wrong idea here. I was only worshiping this thing because it reminds me of you. I'm really worshiping you. No, you really aren't. And that's what the second commandment is all about. True worship must be in spirit. That is engaging the whole heart. Unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be in truth, that is, properly informed. Unless we have knowledge of the God we worship, there is no worship in truth, both are necessary for satisfying and God-honoring worship. We could be inclined to think that we don't have a problem with this commandment. We may not have an idol that we point to or an image that we worship specifically or use as an aid to worship. But Rusty Challenge
challenged us when he preached from 1 John chapter 2, and he asked the question, do we love the world? Do we have things in our life which by our attention and focus are idols for placing God on the throne in our hearts? Do we ever limit God as thinking of him as our co-pilot, filling the blank? Is God the proper object of worship or someone we call on when we can't handle it? Do we diminish God's holiness in our minds to rationalize our sin, which diminishes our understanding and appreciation of His grace? The first commandment requires that we have no other gods. This is a challenge to live out given competing priorities. When we make God something other than who has revealed Himself to be in Scripture, we break the second commandment. We need to allow the full revelation of Scripture to inform our understanding of God. Only an understanding of truth as revealed in Scripture can properly influence our emotions in a way that brings honor to God. We need to be aware of our tendency to fashion God after the way we want Him to be and to shrink into something that we can control and feel comfortable with. We need to be aware of a tendency to allow our emotions to be stirred by something other than truth. When we do those things, we are not worshiping. Do we yield to the Spirit's leading? Are we living Spirit-filled lives? and must be challenged to be in the last month. If we are living spirit-filled lives, we will not look to idols. Are we focused on God as revealed in His Word and not created image? Images? No one can fully describe God. By design, God doesn't tell us what Jesus looked like. We're commanded not to make images to represent God. We worship a God that desires an exclusive relationship with us, and He is jealous for that relationship. We worship a God who says in his word that true worship is in spirit, engaging the whole heart, and in truth, properly in the form of Christ's Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so um, thankful. And, and Father, just challenged by, by those things in our lives that uh, you place before us. Uh, forgive us uh, when we diminish who you are uh, in some way. Help us to be a, a people of the word, that we, we use your word as, as our source for, for who you are.